Well, good morning. I, I love coming here. It's like coming home and um, with my short friends. And so, um, so, hey, we've got short Matt and tall Matt, in case you're wondering about the pastor. So, um, no, we, uh, we, we've done a lot of things, a lot of ministry together. And um, as you guys were um, sharing about Alaska, um, I actually got to go on a mission trip last year to Alaska. And uh, I took um, my oldest son and my dad. We did a three-generation missions trip. And so um, it was pretty cool. My son and I got to baptize my dad um, in Redemption Bay um, in Alaska. It was a pretty awesome experience. Alaska is beautiful. We uh, did some work much like what you guys are going to be doing. We went to the dump, and instead of seagulls flying at the dump, they have bald eagles and signs that says, watch out for the bears. So, um, but it is a beautiful, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. And um, it has been 25 years. Um, I was Matt's dorm leader um, at, at camp. I was 18. He was 16. Um, and then um, we just hit it off from there, and we met Sarah for the first time at our wedding. Not Matt and I's wedding, but me and my wife's wedding. And so, um, and then um, they were at the hospital when our oldest son was born. I was um, not in the room, um, but I, and we were there uh, right before Caden was born, and I was doing dance moves to Thriller, and so trying to make Sarah laugh and have a baby, and so, again, not with me in the room. But um, we are, uh, my wife and I are grateful for your pastors, and um, you may not know it. I would assume that a lot of you do because you've been here for a long time, but you have some of the best pastors that I've ever had the privilege of serving with. Um, yeah. I grew up in Concord. I went to Odell, Northwest, Middle Northwest High. I drove my boys past the schools this morning. Um, and they're like, whoa, those are big schools. Sorry, their school is not nearly as big as either of those schools. But um, I, uh, as he shared, we pastor in West Virginia, um, outside of uh, Washington, D.C. So if they drop an atomic bomb there, we get hit. It's uh, that close. So it's a lot of fun. Um, they moved to West Virginia to get away from taxes um, and some of the politics. That's why people come to West Virginia. Um, we're known for um, family trees that don't go the right way um, and uh, deer. Those are the things that we hit a lot. And so, um, but my wife sends her love. Um, this is a picture of her. Um, I think there, there we are. Yep. We celebrated 20 years of marriage. Um, she um, looks better, and I just look bigger. And so um, the West Virginia, I own a truck, and I have a beard. Those are pre-requirements to moving to West Virginia. So if you ever want to move there, it's not as bad as everybody says. Um, and yes, I've heard all of the jokes. So you don't have to come up to me after service and tell me, hey, have you heard this one? The answer is yes. And so... I have four amazing kids, um, uh, Jack and Channing, are six months behind Matt and Sarah's two kids, um, Caden and Grayson. Each of them are six months behind, and then Oliver and Ben, um, they're our um, adopted boys that God gave to us, and um, we love them. Love you, Ollie. They got to come with me. I, I came down. Uh, my grandpa's birthday is this weekend, and we came down to celebrate his birthday. He turned 98 on Friday, and um, he's still kicking and feisty on Friday when his actual birthday was. Um, it was just some family that was there. He said, uh, I thought there'd be a lot more people at my party. <laughs> and so that's tomorrow. Tomorrow's the party. And so um, when you're 98, you can do whatever you want to. And so you can say whatever you want to. And so... Uh, but I know that um, I saw on the screen and, and talking with Matt, I know you guys are in the middle of your 21 days of prayer and fasting, and I'm not sure what you guys have committed to in this, but we sat down last Sunday with our family, and um, we sit down every year, we go through a prayer and fasting time, and we talk about the things that we're going to uh, give up for 21 days so that we can refocus and recenter our attention on Jesus at the beginning of the year. And so our theme, um, and there are thousands of people that are engaging with this, and so our theme this year um, is praying the word. 
and being people that have the word inside of us so that the word comes out of us. And so um, I, I know that you guys have been taught well on what prayer and fasting is. And, and so I just wanted to share with you about the power of the word. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Well, Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given to us. Um, and Lord, we thank you that, that we are uh, getting to gather together to celebrate um, who you are and what you've done. And Lord, maybe we are here today um, with longings in our heart of needing a touch from you. And so, Lord, your word tells us uh, that you never leave us and you never forsake us. Your word also doesn't tell us that it's going to be easy, but it says you'll be there. And so, Lord, we thank you that you are a constant and you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? Amen. 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 Have you ever had one of those really rough days? Like, it's just like, you're like, I'd like to go back and get back in bed and do it over again. And you're like, nope, I don't want to do that over again. I just want to fast forward. I want to get to the next day. And um, where you just, things are thrown your direction that you just have no control over and you just want to crawl in a hole. And um, I remember my wife telling me a story that one time she was traveling and um, she, they stopped somewhere at a gas station, um, which are always the cleanest places to stop and go to the bathroom. And so um, she needed to go to the bathroom and, and, and they had, as they were traveling, there were more girls than boys. And so um, they were like the individual ones. And so my wife was growing impatient. And so she went into the guy's one and she went in and whoever was there last uh, left the seat up. And so um, doing what any normal person does, um, she, she lifted her leg up up and put the seat down, right? Am, am I the only person that's done that before? <laughs> okay, some of you are unwilling to share. All right, so, so she did, and when it came down, it, it hit the toilet, lit the seat, and, and something popped up off the seat and hit her in the corner of the mouth. I, I don't know how you felt when I told you that, but when I heard that, I was like, I've kissed that mouth. And so... <laughs> So what does that have to do with the sword of the spirit uh, or anything other than my wife needs to choose better when going to the bathroom? But I, I think that we've all had those things happen to us. We've all had those moments in life where, where you're trying your best and all of a sudden you get broadsided with something and, and it's, it's overwhelming and it, and it just seems to take you to your knees. And somehow... We have just grown accustomed to taking it, that, that it's, it's normal. It's normal to endure this pain. It's normal to endure this. And, and we have to love other people, and we, and we love God, and, and I, I guess we're just going to be miserable in the process. Have you ever met people that have followed Jesus for a long time, and you're like, where is the joy in their life? Maybe they've just been hit with a lot of things, and they don't they don't necessarily know how to overcome that. And so by, by putting up these walls around us, it, it kind of diminishes the joy back into the core of our heart, kind of like the Grinch that it's there. It's just, it's just packaged so tight and so small that we can't find it, we can't experience it. My wife didn't have control on what the, was on the toilet, but she had control over where she went, and that's our story as well. This is... What I know, I know that the word of God is our wisdom. It's our light. And, and I believe it's time for the church to, to step into that light, to be people of the word. That, that the word, that you've put it into you so much that it begins to come out of you. That we need to wake up and not only know the, the power of the word, but we need to know how to use it. So my brother... Um, he went to UNCC, and, um, and this was, um, I, I had found Jesus, and, and my brother was choosing to find other things at that time, and, and so he wanted to take a New Testament class at UNCC to understand the things that Jake was processing through. And so he went in, and he called me, and he said, I'm taking this New Testament class. I said, well, tell me about it. He goes, it's taught by a Muslim. So what that tells me is the world understands the value of the knowledge that's found in the word, but not the power behind it. 
We can know the word. We, we can know the verses. We can spout scriptures all day long. But unless those scriptures transform us, we're going to be the same people we were before Jesus. The power of the word isn't in our ability to know it up here. It's in the ability to transform us in here so that our lives look different, so that we, we walk differently, we treat people differently. You know, the golden rule is annoying to kids. Treat other people how you want to be treated. When our natural inclination is, and maybe not just for kids, but our natural inclination is when someone cuts you off in traffic, our natural inclination, what, what that comes up is not always the golden rule. Lord, let them get in an accident. I, I don't know if you ever prayed that before, but like, like not really get hurt, but like they cut me off. So I used to have road rage until I did something to someone that they pulled a big knife out and I was seeing it in my rear view mirror. I determined, you know, my life is way more valuable than, than the three seconds of road rage in that moment. But when we take the word and we allow it to be, to not just come into here, but it comes in, into here. And it, be, it will begin to come out because the word tells us out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what's in here comes out here. So what we put in will come out. And even if you don't believe the word, what the word of God says is true, the enemy does. The enemy believes in the, he knows it's true. He knows that you've been forgiven. He knows that you are a daughter and a son of the most high God, that you are redeemed and that you carry no shame or guilt or condemnation, that you do not have to have a spirit of fear. He knows in the end that we win and he loses. But he's been pulling the same tactics for generations. And what a shame it would be for the enemy to believe more about your potential than you do. The enemy, the enemy can't destroy you. Well, you're like, well, John 10, 10 says the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Yes, he does that. He does destroy, but most of our destruction comes at our choices that we make. So he can't destroy us, so he spends his energy discouraging us, keeping us distracted. And Paul I've been doing a study in the book of Ephesians, and Paul, I love the book of Ephesians. And, and towards the end of it, Paul talks about, he says, you, you've got this armor. And as he was saying it, as, as they would have been reading his letters, they would have known it because the Roman soldiers, the Roman guards, the centurions, they would have been all over the place. They, they, would have, they would have seen a breastplate and they would have pictured in their mind a Roman soldier because they would have seen it every single day of their lives. So why would Paul use something that's so painful because the Romans were not kind to Christians? And he chose to use something so painful to, to prove a point that this is what we have. Because the Roman soldiers, they'd walk through the town and, and whatever they asked you to do, you'd have to do it and you felt helpless. But Paul's saying, no, as Christ followers, we're not helpless. But also as Christ followers, we're not worried about the Romans because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities and powers and rulers of dark places. And so we've been given this, ar this armor and he brings it up and he tells us that we have an enemy that is scheming against us and he's not for us. He wants us to point fingers at others, to blame others. It started back with Adam and Eve, right? Adam says, oh, it's Eve's fault. Eve's the serpent's fault. Like everybody else is somebody else's fault. He wants you to point fingers at others. He wants you to point fingers at your family, at your friends, at the people you do life with. He wants us to direct our weapons at each other and not at him. But Ephesians chapter six, verse 17 says, put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. All the other weapons that are listed are defensive in nature to protect us. One of my favorites as I was studying the armor of God, one of my favorites is the shield. 
And when you put all the armor on, the only places that are left unprotected are your sides. And they didn't need that because they always went into battle together. So there was always someone to your side and you never really had to worry about that which is a reminder that we've got to be together in community, which is why Sunday mornings are so valuable. It's why gathering into groups are valuable. We're not running without being protected. Our mind is protected with salvation. Our heart is protected with the breastplate of right living. We have shoes of peace. We have the belt of truth. And so we're, we're fully protected. We have this defense. We have this shield of faith that's there before us. But we're not just called to just take the barrage from the enemy. We've been given this weapon. A weapon that, that for generations, the average follower of Jesus didn't even read themselves. And through technology, we, we get it. Most of us probably have many paper Bibles at home and we can open up an app on our phone and and we can have hundreds of translations. So what do we do with this sword of the spirit? Do we just take it and we just, when he comes after us, we just chuck it at him? I wish that worked. I wish it worked to just chuck it and he would be gone. Like that would be awesome. But what we've got to do is that in those moments of those attacks coming, that we pray the word and the word comes out of us. But the word's got to be in us before it can come out of us. So I, I, like, I like stories. How many of you guys like stories? Uh, Jesus likes stories. They're called parables. Many of um, you read through the gospels. That's what he taught in a lot. He wanted to teach a lesson. He, he shared a parable. And so there's just a few lessons I want to share with you today. The first one is that you've got to learn to speak the word out loud over your life. And uh, Matt was sharing today that often, you know, we go introspective when it comes to Jesus. Now, any Chiefs fans in here today? No, of course not. Panther fans? We didn't do much cheering this year. So, um, but... uh, you know, last night when we're, the football games were on and today and tomorrow when the games are happening, people are going to get excited for their team. Even if they're sitting at home watching the game, hundreds of miles away from where it's being played, they're going to get excited in that moment. And yet sometimes when we feel about Jesus, it more feels like that it's supposed to be a funeral than a celebration. So I appreciate what Pastor Matt shared this morning about communion being a celebration of of gathering together to celebrate what Jesus has done. And so we we speak the word out loud. There's power in speaking it out loud. And so you can go to Google. If you're not sure, you're like, well, I don't know the Bible very well right now. Google is way smarter than any of us will ever be. And so you go to Google and you can say scripture on this and it will give you a list of things. And so every time you're feeling that, say that scripture out loud. This is our oldest, Jack. This, these pictures were for a num- from a number of years ago. Aw. He's 15 and a half now. He's driving, works at Chick-fil-A, which is where every good pastor's kid works. And so, because um, so, he never has to ask off for Sunday. And so, um, so I remember... Um, there was a season where he would come running into our room at night with tears streaming down his face. And I was wondering if he was sick. Has he puked somewhere that we need to clean up? Did he have a bad dream? Do I need to pretend to be asleep so my wife can deal with it? Like just all of these thoughts running through my mind. But he was afraid. He, he had this fear. It gripped his heart. And, and Lindsay and I have made this declaration multiple times over all of our kids to get off our kids. Satan, you have no place in their life. If you don't believe that there's an enemy coming after your family, after your marriage, after your kids, then, then I would encourage you to check out with some of Paul's writings on it. And so we got in this little book um, by Joyce Meyer 
And uh, it's, it's called The Secret Power of Praying God's Word. And so it's broken down by different things. And so we told him, we gave him this little light and this book and said, anytime that you begin to feel afraid, open up. He had his bookmark in there and he opened it up and he began to read those scriptures out loud. He kept it by his bed. And so whenever that fear would rise up within him, and even just a few months ago, I was... Um, in his room, in that book, while not next to his bed anymore, that book is still in his drawer of, he's got lots of books, but like the, the books that he keeps, like that are his near and dear books, it's still in that stack of books. And so we, we need to take time to, to make scriptures into prayers. You can, you can make them into prayers and, and praying them out loud. And I had a mentor once and um, he actually pastors another church in Concord and, and he, um, he was one of the people, I'm like, man, every time he prayed, it felt like I was reading the Bible. He was just, it was coming out of him. And I'm like, that's what I want. When I pray, I wanna pray the word of God that comes out of me. And so I personally think there's power in speaking it out loud. If you take 1 Timothy 1.7, for example, for God has give, given us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and of self-control. And then in Hebrews 13, he says, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? So then you you, you take and you can speak it out loud like this. God, you did not give me a spirit of fear, but you gave me power, love, and a sound mind. You never leave me. You're my helper, and I will not fear. Or you can just read the scripture out loud. If your kids or someone you know is struggling, you just take and and we've, we've written scriptures on cards before. We've put them up on the mirrors in the bathroom. We've put them in places so that we're reminded of those things because the world has done a great job of ingraining us of the things that it wants to know. But we've got to put those things aside and we've got to allow the word of God to come into our hearts. Our brains change when we read and when we speak the word of God, Satan knows it. And so he's given us plenty, of do, plenty to do to distract us from the truth. So we speak the word over your life and then ask God to give you a life verse. And it sounds so simple. And I remember, um, I grew up in a church in the area and, um, and, and there was a, a season where um, I, I begin to want to go after God, and that church was not fulfilling that. And so um, I, uh, I ran into uh, Tom and Ann Coffey's uh, son and daughter, Diane and Chris. And, um, and they're like, you should come to church. And so that first Sunday, I, I came into church, and, um, and, and people are like raising their hands in worship. I grew up in a Presbyterian church. It was like stand up, sit down, shut up. Like those are the things that kids were responsible to do in that area. And so, um, and, and so I went to that church for the first time that morning. I showed up. I didn't know anybody other than Chris and Diane. And, um, and, and so they were doing, um, there was a, a song that morning, a Stephen Curtis Chapman song. And and they said, if you want to accept Jesus as your savior, come down front. So I came down front. And then they're like, we're going to take you off to the side into this back room. Listen, I didn't know anybody. I'm like, what the heck is going on? What did I just sign up for? And so I, I ended up going back. And I went back that night. They had Sunday night church. And people bought my food. And it was awesome. And so I kept coming back. And so um, went back Wednesday night for youth group. And, um, and, and so, but I the name of the youth group at that time was Youth Wave, and it wasn't even spelled correctly, and so, which was the common thing to do in the 90s for youth groups. And so, uh, but Jeremiah 29, 11 was the theme verse. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to give you a future and a hope. And it was in a season of my life where, where there was a lot of things that were shaking and, and that day, and some of the people that are in this room are, are because it was because of Jesus and those families that I'm still in church today. 
Some of those families you'll never see up on the stage, but they shared with me more about being a Jesus follower than any person on a platform ever did. A life verse is something that you memorize and in those moments of your life, it gives you, it gives you hope. It revitalizes when you're, when you're in that place of struggle and of tension. It, it speaks to those places. And so if you don't have a life verse, I, I would encourage you to use the rest of your, you've got 14 days left. And if you haven't jumped into the 21 days of prayer and fasting, I'm, I'm saying that they can still jump in, right? Yeah, yeah. It, 14 is, is still better than zero. So we're good. At our church, we're announcing it this week and next week. We're like, people you can get in, you're good. It's all good. Um, but f- use this time to ask God, what is, what is my life verse? Lesson number three is to to hide the word in your heart so it's there when you need it. Because Matthew reminds us out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so what we put in, puts out, and and this is Oliver, and perfect timing, he just left. So, all right, so this is Ollie. Ollie is, um, I think there's Ollie. Is there Ollie? Is he there? I don't know, there he is. So Ollie is... um, he has two levels of volume. It's extremely loud and asleep. Those are the two levels. Like, um, and so he's like the Energizer Bunny on crack is like what he just, he like is just hardcore. And he's our athlete and he's adopted. So obviously he doesn't get it from me. And so um, I, um, and growing up, I mean, at three years old, he could throw a spiral. Like I thought, man, this guy's gonna be a prodigy. He's gonna make me lots of money. And so, uh, but he, he would run circles around the kids, like when we'd have rec soccer and basketball, and he would just run circles around them. And as the other kids have gotten older, and, and they've practiced and they've worked, and, um, and he has been naturally gifted, and he loves the games, but he's not a fan of practice. And, um, and we try to teach him, but practicing is hard, right? And the Word of God is the same thing. I can't tell you how many times I've sat down with someone and they're like, it, it's just, I, I just gave up reading because it was just too hard. Like, it's just, it's too hard to understand what it is that, that God is trying to speak to us. I'm like, where did you start? They're like Isaiah or like Revelation. I'm like, well, that's a really bad place to start. And so, but, but what, we, what we see is the word of God, it's the foundation of our life. And so we, we take and we put it in and we put it in, and we may not need it today, but we put it in. And I don't know if you've ever done the, the life journaling where you read and you do the soap, scripture, observation, application, prayer. I've been doing it for about 15 years, no longer than that, probably 20 years now. And, and so, but when we get pressed, that's, that's when you see who you really are. Like, most of us, have, and maybe not, maybe you're better than my family, but um, maybe this has been a Sunday morning experience with you where you're driving to church and you're arguing and you get to church and the doors open and the smile comes on. Am I the only one? Okay, some of you are nodding your head, but you're like trying to do it nonchalant. You're moving your eyes up and down. You're like, I got it, I got it. So, so we can take and we can, we can fake being a Jesus follower for a short amount of time. Like we can, we can muster up, we can muster up some joy for about an hour and 15 minutes or however long the preacher chooses to go today. So, but when we get pressed, when you get cut off in traffic and those things begin to rise up. So when we get pressed, it's kind of like an accordion. So uh, an accordion, a musician will squeeze in and pull it out and, and while attempting to make it a beautiful sound, and if I were to do it, it would sound like a dying chicken. And so, but when you are constantly putting the word of God in your life, when the enemy comes to try to distract you and try to bring chaos into your life, when your life is pressed and it's full of the word of God, there's not much pressing that's gonna be able to happen because your foundation is strong. It's how Paul can write that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control in the midst of being in prison. Not many prison letters are leaving the jails today with those kind of words. 
Or how he could say, do everything without complaining while being shipwrecked. Or getting beaten and saying, always rejoice. When my parents were spanking me, those were not the words coming out of my mouth, right? <laughs> His foundation was strong when, when Paul's life was pressed like an accordion. Because his foundation was the truth of God's word. And so maybe today, maybe, maybe life is good. Life's going really well. But there will be a day when the enemy of your soul wants to crush you. And it's in that moment, what is your soul going to be like? What is your foundation going to be like? Ephesians 6, he says a final word. He's written all of these things. And if you've not studied Ephesians, I would highly encourage you to do that. Gives us a great glimpse of how to walk out being a follower of Christ. He says, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil for we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then, after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on your belt of truth, and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you'll be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arts of the arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So my challenge for you this week is to speak the word out. Learn to do that. It's not gonna come naturally. If you don't do that, take it and, and just go, to, go, go find some psalms. Go, go pick, open up the psalms and just begin to, to say those out loud. Ask God to give you your life verse and begin to hide the word in your heart. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for who you are. We thank you that your son was sent so that we could have life. Lord, that he came to live a life that we couldn't and died a death that we should have. Lord, I, I thank you for grace and mercy. And Lord, I pray that as we dive into your word, Lord, that we would become people of your word, that we would pray your word, that out of the abundance of our heart would be your word. Lord, we thank you and we praise you in your name. Amen.